Right, we're live, so you can take it away whenever. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just wait a couple. People are still coming in. So I guess even in the, top, in the middle of the pandemic, everything is still academic time. I can't actually see the room. Um, is it? Is there pe are the people there? Is it still filling up? There's 200 people in the room. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> one of them being Sid Redner. Yeah, one of them being me. So I thought we had like a floating participant who shows the room, but I guess not. Yeah, you see, the room is pretty empty. Uh, this is like Pi. Uh, I think it's a it's a plugin for for Python. Oh, sorry. So, Sid. Yeah, it's right in this morning. Uh, tomorrow morning. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sid, could you be my eyes and ears? When is the when are we asymptoted on? Um, people there in the actual room physically? Uh, I think this is probably the asymptotic behavior. <laughs> okay. Four people in the room. Five people, including them. Okay, five people. Okay, um, including, um, that includes Scott and Ben? Okay. Um, all right, Michael Lockman just joined, but I figure we can probably get started. Um, Okay, everybody, um, Ben, in a very uh, in exemplary SFI style, works on many different topics. So last time we heard him discussing um, aspects of biology down into the nitty gritty details of experimental systems, um, uh, relating it to issues of thermodynamic efficiency and information theory. Um, but he's actually done probably, I would say, most of your work, Ben. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if there is to be the mode of the work that he's done, actually has to do with things that are somewhat that are that grew out of Jim Sethna's work, which we've seen before here within the past year here at the SFI, on um, basically um, how to deal with the uh, huge number of parameters in statistical models, why it is and how it is that we can actually get science to work in a very broad sense. And so today we are quite fortunate to have uh, Ben um, presenting more um, advances, deeper understanding along these lines. Um, rational ignorance, deeper understanding about rational ignorance. There we go. So take it away, Ben. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's a wonderful introduction. And, uh, and it's been a wonderful visit. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Lots of people here, um, and it's been a great, a great time. Um, and thanks to, to all of you who made it to my talk, uh, one way or another, braving uh, the plague and snowstorms and bad internet connections. Um, so uh, uh, I hope this should be casual and, and people should ask lots of questions. Uh, um, okay, so uh, to get people kind of thinking about the ideas that this talk is going to be about. Um, uh, here's a, just a snapshot of a simulation of, of water. Um, water is very complicated. It's, it's really all I want you to take from this. Um, if I really wanted to understand how a, a solute, that's the, um, the, the blue and, and, and uh, the blue molecule there, how it, how it moves around in water, um, you'd really need to do a very complicated simulation. Um, but if all you care about is its, is its um, uh, uh, translational motion at long time scales, um, all you need is this diffusion equation. And somehow all of these details um, end up mattering only um, through their effects on this one number, the diffusion constant. Um, something sort of similar happens in a lot of different models. I'm going to go into more detail about this. But here's a picture um, uh, of the inside of a cell. This is just a cartoon. It's just very complicated. Um, and uh, you can write down models that come out of this. So um, this is a schematic of one of those models. Um, and in this particular model, um, all these things in circles are proteins. 
And the arrows are, are, are reactions that the proteins carry out, um, cross correlations and things like that. And, and you can put numbers to all of those things. Um, this particular model has, has uh, uh, 48 parameters. Um, and if you run the model, um, you can do a pretty good job of fitting data. Um, and, and I think maybe you'd agree with me that these are not 48 parameter curves. So this um, has a height, maybe a width. This one just has a height and a, 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 a time. Um, maybe there's four or five parameters there, um, but there's certainly not 48. Um, and indeed, um, in some work that I'll tell you just a little bit about, um, uh, Mark Transtrom uh, was able to show that you could really get very equivalent behavior with a much simpler model. So this is a schematic um, for a model that that he reduced this model to, which only has 12 parameters. Um, one thing I want you to notice, because it'll be important later, is that even with these 48 parameters, um, you can't fit these little bumps, right? So um, the line does not go through all of this. Go ahead. Should I be sharing the whole screen? Or no, no. Go on the other end. That should be better. Um, is it better? I'll try and speak more directly. At the hey, no, it's not better. <laughs> it's worse. Let's see. Scott. <laughs> um. <laughs> it, it, is it possible? It's my computer's sound microphone rather than the mic. Maybe I should continue. Yeah. Is it for those online? Now You're very noisy, very noisy. It's, it's unpleasant. I wonder if is any. I think Scott's coming back. This. Sounds better. Uh, excellent. How's this? Let's go with this. Uh, uh, It's still coming in hot. All right, that maybe. Let's go with this. Is that better? Awesome. Thank you. Um, Okay, so so I guess what I want you to take from this is 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 partly that this reduced model does do a good job, and then maybe you should be impressed that even with forty eight parameters, it is possible to capture quantitatively some of the things that's happening in this whole mess. Okay, so so why do we want why do we prefer a simple model um, uh, that uh, and and there's a couple of reasons that I want to uh, go over quickly. One is that. Um, a simpler model might avoid overfitting. So I showed you that even that complicated model um, didn't do a lot of overfitting. Um, I'll have a little bit more to say about this. Um, there's also aesthetics. Um, so I think this is a very valid reason, um, uh, uh, but it's not something that I'm gonna be talking about too much more here. Um, and it might be easier computationally. Um, but actually 
I think the reason you might prefer a, a simpler model in the case of diffusion, and I will argue also in, in the systems biology models, um, is that most parameters of complex models are actually irrelevant um, in a very precise sense, um, that they don't actually make any input, any impact on, on observables that you'd be able to see in an experiment. Um, and, and then what I'm going to tell you is that a simpler model um, in a very concrete way actually learns more from an experiment. Um, so that, that, that's one of the things that, that I'm going to be arguing for here. And the second thing is that it should still be possible. Um, so if, if you think that the reason you should prefer a simpler model is that most parameters don't matter, um, then it seems intuitively that you ought to be able to use a more complicated model if you don't know how to reduce your model. Um, and, and I'm going to argue that indeed you can still use a complicated model to make unbiased predictions. Okay, so um, uh, so I want to motivate the idea of, of making a parameter ensemble, and, and, and I'm going to do that by showing this climate model, or this is not a climate model, but, but, but to, to, to um, tell you about um, a goal of climate modeling. So, um, so here are the temperature anomalies from 1880 to 2018, um, and uh, uh, a model for this would have a lot of diverse data. Um, you can sort of imagine what that would be. Um, uh, you could build a very complicated multi-parameter model, and one goal of this would be to predict um, the future of climate. Um, so you'd want to be able to predict um, what this map might look like uh, in the future. Um, and I think you'd agree that, that, that the reason this is difficult is because we can't pin down all of the parameters. So for example, um, we might not know how much uh, of an influence melting snow will have on increasing uh, the absorption of radiation. Um, uh, and, 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 and one idea of a parameter ensemble is that, that we can get a quantitative handle on it um, with an approach uh, schematically like this. Um, so what I want to do is, is, is make the probability for future predictions be some sort of an average over, over my model uncertainty. Um, so this part here is, is some integral over possible values my parameters might have very schematically. Um, and for each one, I want to weight the probability of a particular prediction. Um, and to go into a little bit more detail, these terms that I've colored blue, um, those are related to how consistent each possible model is to the data that I already have. Um, so I'm going to fit um, my model um, to existing data, whatever that might be. Um, and, whoop, and this red term, which is going to be the subject of, of, of this talk, is about deciding on what measure to give. Um, to parameter space. So I'm going to be talking about this in the context of an uninformative prior, but I want you to think about this as just being a measure on the space of parameters um, that, that this model could have. And in particular, you want a measure that really gives equal weight to every distinguishable prediction. Um, so, so every model that makes a different prediction, you want to give equal weight to. Okay, so um, I'm going to give the central claims of this talk first. Um, and, and, and one of them is that this approach can work even if my model has too many parameters. Um, so even if I don't know how to reduce it to a model that, that uh, every parameter is independently fit by, the claim is that you can still use this approach. Um, but the prior that, that is most often used in this context, Jeffrey's prior, um, I will explain what that is. And I'll, I'll tell you that Jeffrey's prior actually introduces extreme bias if I use it for a model that has too many parameters. Um, and the reason that I'm going to give it to you qualitatively now is that Jeffrey's prior really conflates two distinct uh, notions of parameter space measure. Um, so what I told you is that what we're looking for is a measure that gives equal weight to every distinguishable prediction. Um, and in this space that I'm showing you here, um, inside of the green is the space of possible models. Um, and on this space, there's a measure um, which where, where distance is measured in, in terms of standard deviations. Um, and equally distinguishable predictions, I can qualitatively do um, by putting this model on some graph paper. And roughly, whenever my model goes through one of these squares, that means it's distinguishable from its nearby models, and I want to give that equal weight. What are the axes of this plot? Uh, I will explain in detail what the axes of this plot are. Okay. Um, um, but for now, um, these are different models. So, so different points in this are different model parameters. And the distance between points is how easy it would be to distinguish them from data 
in units of standard deviations. Um, so th this is the goal is to do a weighting on parameter space, something like how many squares does this go through? And, and I wanna highlight that this is very different from weighting things by their volume. In particular, here there's the same number of blobs as there are squares here. Um, but you can see that this gives very little weight to this end of the model space here um, because it's very thin, even though um, this thinness is much less than one. So there's no reason to care about whether you can distinguish models on one side or the other anyway. Um, so what I'm gonna argue is that this really gets to be a very extreme problem in high dimension and that this is the reason Jeffrey's prior doesn't work. So that's where we're going. Um, and I'm also gonna introduce an unbiased optical measure. And for this particular model, um, this is what that weighting would look like. Yeah. Yeah, does it, does it matter if the different models have structure, like some hierarchical structure to them? And I guess what I mean is in the biological case, you could have a huge network and you're just asking like which, which reduction of that network it makes the most sense or gives the most predictive power. In the case of climate models, you could actually say I'm using the same theory, I'm just taking different approximations of the Navier-Stokes and I'm deciding whether to do that on a 2D sphere or in a 3D system. And, and how many terms, is it hydrostatic or not? How many terms do I keep around? Like, is, is that an important distinction? Yeah, so uh, what the, the prior that, that, that I'll be advocating for in this talk, um, if, you, if you apply it to a model with too many parameters, it will do a weighted sum of the different sum models. Um, so uh, so um, we haven't looked at, at climate models at all. Um, uh, just a motivating example, but I'm sure that it would do this. It would pick out, um, you know, a collection of different possible simplifications of the big model class, if that answers. Yep, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, so that, that's, what I'm, uh, that's where I'm going. Um, to give an outline, I'm first gonna uh, introduce some statistics. I'm gonna talk about the Fisher information metric, which is um, the measure on the space that I just showed you. Um, I'm gonna uh, talk about sloppiness and hyperurban geometries, and in particular, tell you about a particular structure that these models have. Um, I'm gonna tell you uh, that edges are simpler models. Um, so uh, we were just discussing this a little bit. Um, and then I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction to uninformative priors. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you about uh, what's really new in this talk. Um, I'm gonna tell you about priors which maximize the mutual information between parameters and the data that they will see. Um, I'm gonna tell you that Jeffrey's prior actually introduces this extreme bias um, by using this incorrect measure. Okay, um, so just uh, to, to get everyone on the same page with some statistics um, and, and notation, I'm always gonna be talking about parameters theta um, and, and inferring those parameters from data X. Um, and so here's an example. Um, I might have a, a model uh, that's a sum of exponentials. So a sum of N exponentials, um, and I wanna fit the rates at which these decay. Um, that's gonna make a deterministic prediction why um, and I'm gonna make the assumption that, that um, my data is of the form that it's Gaussian distributed around the deterministic value of Y. So the probability of X is gonna be uh, a multivariate Gaussian um, centered on the deterministic predictions of the model. Um, and, and one approach to understanding models this way is, is, is looking for the maximum likelihood estimate. So this is the, the parameter theta, which maximizes the probability of having produced the data. Um, Why are the sum of the exponentials all the same weight? I mean, couldn't they be different weights? They could. Does uh, that change anything in what you're saying? It, it does change. Uh, it, it qualitatively changes the picture. Um, it doesn't, uh, sorry, quantitatively changes the picture. Um, uh, it turns out that the models I'm going to be showing all have this form. Um, um, it, it, it won't qualitatively change things. A band? Ben, yes. So, so I'm a little bit confused about the notation in your likelihood p of x yes. given theta. Um, there's no theta on the right hand side. Is that? Yeah, the, the theta is implicit through y. So is y a conditional distribution or is it a parameterized function? Yeah, I'm sorry. So y is a, is deter is a deterministic function of theta given by this? It's a deterministic function of t parameterized by theta. Wait, um, it's a distribution it, it, over t parameterized by theta? There's, there's, it's a deterministic function of t and theta. 
I'm sorry, I should not have this bar here. That should probably be a comma if that's, um, so y is a function of t and theta um, and the probability distribution on x that is, um, you know, that this is a, um, this depends on theta um, implicit or implicitly because of the dependence on y. So we could just make it all work by getting rid, by changing that vertical bar in the first one to a comma. And then in the second one, rather than we, y of ti, it would be y of ti comma theta. Sure, yes. Okay, got it, thank you. Yes. Okay, and so, uh, so, um, so the maximum likelihood estimate on theta is, is just the theta which maximizes this. Um, okay, so at the best fit, I can take a derivative with respect to theta of, of the probability um, and I get zero, right? So it's, it's the best fit. Um, and, and the next thing I can do is define Hessian of, of, of this. Um, so this is the second derivative of, of the probability distribution. Now, this is the best fit. Um, and so uh, uh, the Hessian is going to be uh, positive when it's defined this way. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's symmetric and positive definite. Um, and so it defines really uh, confidence ellipses as I get close to the best fit. Um, uh, so uh, if these ellipses are long, that means um, uh, I can move a long way in parameter space before I get a model with a substantially different cost. Um, if, if the ellipses are short, that means I don't have to move very far before uh, my data rules out those parameter values. Okay, so, so that's the Hessian, and I wanna quickly switch to thinking about um, the Fisher information. So before I actually see any data, um, I can define the Fisher information as the expectation value of the Hessian, um, given the data that arises from that model. So um, this is gonna be the second derivative of log P, but in expectation value, um, given the, the expected data that I'm gonna see, um, this is still positive and symmetric definite. And, and now this actually defines, um, uh oh. <laughs> Uh, good enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so this um, this this defines a, a Riemannian metric on the space, and what that means is I can I can think about um, um, a proper distance, if you will, um, between models that are close by in space, um, and this distance is really going to be measured in, in units of standard deviations. So it's, it's, it's a measure of how distinguishable two close by models are gonna be from the data that one of them will produce. Okay. Um, so um, the, the, the main point about sloppy models, and I'm gonna explain why this is, is that G um, is positive, it's symmetric, um, and its eigenvalues are evenly spaced in log. Um, uh, so let me just show you some examples of that. These are models, um, from a variety of, of different areas of science. Um, here's discrete diffusion, um, which I'll actually talk about a little bit. Um, this is a, a multi-parameter icing model. Um, this is the sum of exponentials. Um, uh, and, and this is that systems biology model that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and, uh, and, and what you're seeing here is the eigenvalues plotted in log space. And, and what's really important about this is that they're evenly distributed over many orders of magnitude. Um, and, and this is not a random matrix ensemble. This is a, a, a very different ensemble. Um, and and uh, physically what this means is that there are some parameter combinations that are orders of magnitude more easily to infer uh, from data than others. So um, I, I'm, I'm really confused, like for say discrete diffusion, you know, which is just one equation. Like how is it that you trying to match it to like a sum of exponentials? What is the, what's going I, on? I will show you. Okay. The discrete diffusion in more detail. That's that's an example okay. that I'll show. So so um, uh, that's an attempt to to um, to address this question of why water, um, which is very complicated, just has the diffusion constant. Okay. Um, um, but 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 I guess the what I what's what's really important from this slide is that that here um, a long direction, so an eigenvector with a large corresponding eigenvalue. Um, uh, that will be very easy to infer that parameter with high precision from data 
Um, whereas a small eigenvalue means that I can um, move many orders of magnitude um, without changing the cost. Okay, so I can also think about um, this in data space. So for a least squares model, um, the metric has this form. Um, and um, and what um, maybe if you're very good at embeddings and geometry, what you can see is that this is just the form that's gotten um, by embedding uh, the model parameters into the space of their data. Um, so here's an example of that. If I just um, fit my sum of exponentials to two data points, these are shown here, um, I can think about the metric as coming about um, by embedding each parameter into the space of their data. So now I'm plotting um, the second data point, y of t2, versus the first data point. Um, and, and this is the metric space of the Fisher information, right? Um, if that's okay. So um, uh, uh, what I uh, want you to take from this is, is firstly that even though the parameters can go from zero to infinity, right? There's no reason the rates couldn't be zero or infinite. Um, the information geometry space is bounded. Um, and, and you can see that because no matter what my parameters are, um, these two data points, the, the y's that, that they correspond to will always go between zero and one. So that means they always need to fit in the square. Um, and it's a funny shape because for example, y of t2 um, needs to be smaller than y of t1 because they're decaying exponentials. Um, so this is the space. Um, is, this, is this okay? People are... I mean, I mean, you're still, I mean, I'm still not seeing the connection with like discrete diffusion with just like one. That, that, that's coming, um, but, but, but the information geometry and, and that this is um, the metric that corresponds to, to the sum of exponentials, I guess is um, what I hope is clear at this point. Okay, so, um, so as an experimental fact, um, when, I, when I take one of these models and I look at its uh, uh, model manifolds, so the, the manifold that I was showing before in higher dimensions, um, they have this characteristic structure that they're, uh, uh, we call them hyper um, So uh, So here I'm, I'm showing a sum of three exponentials in three dimensional space. And um, what I hope you can notice is that it has this very long direction here. Um, uh, that that corresponds to to, um, to to this direction in two. Um, then it has a second direction um, which is thinner, and a third direction which is extremely thin. Um, and to remind you, distance measures distinguishability, and this means that there are two parameters that I might be able to infer from data, but the third one is extremely indistinguishable. Right? It, it's very thin. Um, any two models that only differ in that third direction are going to differ by a very small amount. So, so Ben, I've got a really dumb question. I'm missing a little bit about what you mean about embedding. If I've got more data than parameters, um, presumably you're going to be embedding into a submanifold of the data space, and I'm not really seeing what is meant by that. Well, for you, example, if I was what's the consequences of this. So for, for example, if I was just fitting a single exponential to, to two data points, um, then my model would just be this line. But a single model. A so, okay, but that, but, that, but that dimension right there is the dimensionality of the number of parameters. It's not the dimension of the number of data points. If I had three data points, what would it mean to, what you're thinking about how exactly I embed a two parameter model into a space with three data points? Well, um, okay, so, so, so on this space, which is two dimensional, uh, a model with just a single parameter, if, if that has the same mystery, that would just be a line through this, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and if I, you know, if I took a third data point, um, you'd want to embed this in three dimensions, but I'd still have a sheet in three dimensions. Um, and that sheet would get its metric from its embedding in three dimensions, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I understand algebraically. I'm not quite sure I understand the 
um, what I'm to take away from the pictures, but that's okay. Well, um, I guess what I what I want you to take is that um, this has this particular structure of being a hyper ribbon that it has a very long axis, and then every successive axis is smaller by by a geometric factor. Okay, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So why why sloppiness? Um, uh, and and I think in this model it's easy to understand this from interpolation. Um, so. Um, so the sum of exponentials actually has all sorts of, um, of, of constraints. Um, and, and for example, um, once I fix a time point at, at, at t equals a third, um, um, I know that all successive time points are gonna be lower than that, right? And that's because the first derivative of any sum of exponentials um, is always decreasing. Um, and, and it turns out um, after I've pinned that down, actually, I'm sorry, I should have first pinned this one down, um, but, but every time I, I pin down a successive data point, um, I vastly constrain what the other data points can do. Um, so, um, so it turns out that each data point I constrain um, constrains all of the other data points by a geometric factor. Um, and that's one way of understanding why you get this particular structure. Um, and just to, to highlight this in a slightly more general way, a predictive model is really not the same as just curve fitting. So in curve fitting, if I have a high enough order polynomial, I can go through all of these points. Um, but if you have a mechanistic model, it's not like that in this particular way um, that intermediate points will constrain other points. Um, so, so committing yourself to, to modeling some data as a sum of exponentials um, is very different from curve fitting. It's saying that you know something about the problem and you don't expect a general polynomial. Um, you expect a curve that has a negative first derivative and a positive second derivative and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, hopefully this is to answer your question. Um, uh, I, I think this is a slightly different reason um, from, from why- um, uh, The sum of exponential is finite. Um, the sum of exponentials um, for, for this example um, is- Not In is, general, your-, your... <laughs> Your statement are true if the sum is finite. Um, it's true even if the sum is not finite, as long as I prohibit myself from using um, uh, exponentials with positive exponents. So as long as all of the exponentials are decreasing this holds, if that's okay. Does that make sense? Um, not sure, but go on, it's not important. Um, uh, okay, so, um, so to get at this question that, that, that um, you were asking before, Sid, um, uh, one thing you could imagine is a model um, uh, for, for microscopic hopping. So the particular model that we considered um, had a particle that every time step um, could hop to one of its six nearest neighbor sites or stay where it is. Um, so this model has seven parameters if you, if you allow it to non-conserve um, um, uh, particle number or six parameters if you wanted to conserve particle number. Um, and, and you could ask if you're able to see the distribution at some later time point, how easy would it be to look at these parameters? And so if you look after just a single time point, um, really you can measure each parameter independently, right? So if I, um, if I start a bunch of particles at the origin, um, I wait one time step um, and I look at the density, um, I would be able to measure all seven of those parameters independently. Um, but you know that as time evolves, if I let them hop according to this um, repeatedly, that the central limit theorem says um, that eventually they should reach a Gaussian. Um, and a Gaussian has two parameters, or in this case, three, if we allow it to non-conserve um, particle density. Um, and, and indeed, if you look at the Fisher information after many time steps, what you see is that there's this hierarchy that develops. Um, so the largest one um, is non-conservation of particle number. The longer I wait, the easier it's gonna be to see whether the particles are, are destroyed or, or creating more of themselves. Um, the next one is the drift. So this is a, relative, uh, a relevant parameter in an RG analysis. And indeed, the longer you wait, the easier it is to detect a small drift. Um, the next one is the diffusion constant. Um, and then all these further uh, uh, parameters don't have names, but they 
uh, parameterize things like the third cumulant of the resulting distribution and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so the claim is that this is sort of a general feature that when you look at models that are coarse grained um, much more than their microscopic scale, um, they will have a structure like this. Okay, um, here is just a, 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 another way to think about this. Um, here, the blue particles and red particles have a very different um, uh, kernel when they hop a single time step, um, but we've carefully matched them to have the same diffusion constant and zero drift. Um, so if you wait for a while, these distributions become identical. Um, and, and here, looking back at that um, original distribution, what I'm showing you is just um, the principal component analysis of the information geometry space. And what you can see is that um, these two uh, kernels, which look very different microscopically, um, get very close as time evolves. Okay. Um, so are simple models available? Um, so on a hyper ribbon, um, every point is close to an edge, in fact, a very high dimensional edge. Um, and if you look at this example more carefully, um, it turns out that, that the three edges have, have names. So one of them um, or, or, or are writable downable. Um, so for example, this edge here, um, this is a one parameter model where I've set the two exponentials uh, K1 to equal K2. Um, another thing I can do is set one of the exponentials um, to have a rate of zero um, or a rate of infinity. Um, and, and in this example, at least, edges are simpler models with one less parameter. Um, and um, in really elegant work um, that I, I had no involvement with uh, from, from Mark, um, uh, uh, Mark showed that this is actually quite general. Um, and he developed a, 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 a method to iteratively go to the edges, the closest edge of the model, um, write down the reduced model, and then, and then keep iterating this procedure. And that's actually how he did this um, model simplification that I showed at the beginning. So he started with this very complicated model. Um, and by iteratively going to the edges, he found this reduced model, um, an edge of the higher dimensional model, um, which is very close. Okay, so just, just to recap this, the Fisher information measures distance. If I look at typical models, um, their, their geometry has this hyper ribbon structure. Um, and, and in particular, the edges are simpler models. Okay, so I, I want to move to talking about Bayesian inference. Um, and uh, my mother sent me this, hi mom, uh, 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 this Onion article. Um, and, and actually, uh, the, the title is awesome. But actually, this is a reasonable abstract for this talk. Um, we're going to learn how to use statistical analysis to assess priors, uh, minimize biases, and Anyway, um, I was very amused. Um, but I do want to start by recapping um, Bayesian priors and model selection. Um, so, so Bayes' theorem is math. Um, here's the math. I can derive the probability of, of X and Y happening together um, in two different ways. One is I can multiply the probability of X times the probability of Y given X, or I could do the reverse. Um, and if you set these equal to each other, you derive Bayes' theorem. So you can't argue with this, it's just mathematics. Um, but the Bayesian approach to statistics um, sweeps something under the rug, um, which is that if you want to apply this, you really need a prior. Um, and the idea is that um, uh, what I would really like is to understand the probability of different parameters, that's P of theta, given the data that I've seen, and I can use Bayes' rule. So my, my model makes a prediction for the probability of different uh, outcomes. Um, and, and I can use Bayes' rule as long as I have this prior. Um, now, if, you're, if your distribution has a prior, there's nothing wrong. Um, but it's kind of a hand wavy thing to do because it's not really parameterizing a probability distribution, right? A prior is, is really parameterizing um, your uncertainty about the world, right? If you really have the right model, the correct, prop, the correct parameters would be a delta function somewhere. You just don't know where. And it's a little bit hokey to parameterize your uncertainty with a probability distribution in this way. Um, so how do you choose a prior? Um, uh, what what um, I'm gonna be advocating for here is to choose one which maximizes the amount that you'll learn from your experiment. 
Okay, so the first thing I need to convince you of is that a flat prior is sick. Um, so for example, um, uh, if I'm trying to estimate K1 and K2 here, and I just have a flat prior, um, 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 what I want you to notice is that um, this would put all of the weight at K1 and K2 infinite, right? So there's infinite parameter space there. And so actually, all of my prior weight is going to be uh, effectively on this one model that decays instantaneously, right? Um, so, um, so not only is that weird because the prior puts all of its weight on this one effective model, it also learns nothing from experiment. And, and that's because even though um, this model is not terribly close to the experimental data, it's not infinitely far away. So when I update my model, according to Bayes' rule, um, the posterior will also look like this. Another way to argue against the flat prior is that this parameterization is somewhat arbitrary. Um, so I could have instead asked to estimate tau one and tau two. This is um, clearly the same model, right? This is another reasonable way to parameterize the model. Um, but this would actually give totally different predictions, right? So, um, so, so if I parameterize it this way, my flat prior would instead say, your model should never decay. And again, I've learned nothing from data. So this is not reparameterization invariant, and it learns nothing from data. Okay, so Jeffrey's prior takes its measure from the experiment that you're going to perform. Um, and as motivation, Jeffrey's argued that the idea is, 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 as I was saying before, that you should put equal weight on every distinguishable model. Um, and Jeffrey's prior is literally the volume element of the Fisher information matrix. Um, so it depends on the expected data because the Fisher information does. Um, and, um, and, and I guess what you should take from this is that Jeffrey's prior is equally weighting volume in this space here, in this case area, right? Okay, so uh, Jeffrey's prior is sick for models which are hypervens. And I think the easiest way to say, see this is, is by looking at this. So, um, so Jeffrey's prior is gonna measure the n-dimensional volume. Um, in this case, this is the three-dimensional volume here, but I think you'd probably agree that this is effectively a two-dimensional model here. Um, and as a result, weighting it by, by, by its three-dimensional volume doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's gonna suffer from this problem that I showed you before, um, that, that if I weight things by their equal intrinsic volumes, um, maybe what you can see here is that this edge, which is very thin, and you can see that because there aren't very many circles here. Um, I should say that this is sampled according to Jeffrey's prior. Um, um, that doesn't really reflect um, that these models are, are just as distinguishable, right? Um, they're the equivalent of being somewhere out in the tail here. Okay, so what we really want is a prior which is not just invariant to changes in parameterization, but a prior which is invariant to adding a parameter that can't be seen. So we want a prior um, that if I add a, a, a parameter that doesn't do a whole lot, um, it should give similar predictions. Okay, and um, uh, what we're gonna advocate for is maximizing the mutual information um, between the parameters and their expected data. Um, and, uh, uh, and I can write this in two different ways. So one is the entropy in parameter space minus the entropy in parameter space after I see my data. Um, and I could alternatively write it as the reduction in entropy in the data space after I tell you the parameters. So I have to argue for you that this is a natural thing to do. Um, and, and mutual information, I would argue, really uh, quantifies how much you expect to learn from an experiment. Um, so this is an optimist interpretation. Um, if I write the, the mutual information as the entropy in parameter space, minus the entropy in parameter space after I see my data, then I think maybe you'd agree with me, this is a good quantification of how much I'm gonna learn from an experiment. Um, another way that you can argue for this um, is, is what I call a pessimist interpretation. And this is that, well, you really don't know what your parameters are, um, but you want your, your, um, uh, you want your, your, your model, your, your prior, um, to minimize the worst case. So whatever the worst case probability distribution is, um, and, and I can quantify that by asking what the KL divergence is between a particular model um, 
and, and my P of X, which comes from the prior, um, if I want to minimize that, this is actually equivalent. So Ben? Yes. Yeah, I've often, this is, this is a part of the, um, uh, the approach that I've often been conf that I'm confused by because there are many justifications, of course, for why you want to quantify everything with a probability distribution to reflect your uncertainty and so on and so forth. There's Definetti's arguments, Cox's algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. From a sort of more high level point of view, you might want to say this is what um, God thinks the distribution over possible realities is in the situation that we're facing. You are instead here, though, not choosing the anything based upon what God might have done, anything based upon my uncertainty. You're instead saying, I'm just going to, it feels like cheating. I'm just going to choose my prior so that whatever God decides, so long as he's using my prior, I'm telling God what to do, I'm going to then be able to just um, use my data maximally. So I'm saying, God, use my prior, because that'll make life easier for me. So you can phrase this as a betting. This is the optimal strategy of what I would say is a betting game with God. So, um, so the game is I get to choose my prior, um, and then uh, my prior determines what I think is going to happen. It determines a probability distribution on the data. Um, and then God's allowed to look at my prior and choose the actual parameter values of the system. Um, and we're going to bet on the outcome. And, and FKL is actually my expected loss in this game. So that's, um, you know, th that's how much I will lose if, if God chooses parameter values data. And, and one way to phrase maximizing the mutual information is you're trying to minimize the worst case loss. So I don't, does that? Okay, I think that is a little bit more compelling. In this game, it's an iterative game you're assuming, I guess. Yeah, so this is assuming it's a one-shot game. You write down your prior, you haven't seen any data yet. Um, um, th there's other versions of it, but the way you derive the mutual information maximizing prior, it's, it's just a one-shot game. Okay, to be honest, that, that, that's more compelling, I think, than the other argument. Okay, okay, thanks for okay. that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, uh, they're, they're formally equivalent. Yeah, no, I can, I can understand that, but one strikes me as telling God what to do, and the yeah, other yeah. is that I need to protect myself against God. Yeah, I think, um, um, well, okay, I would call this the pessimist interpretation, right? That, uh, okay, yeah. God is trying to trick you, uh, as opposed to you're hoping to learn as much as possible but I agree, they're, they're, uh, it's interesting that they agree. Um, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, uh, here are some results. So um, uh, if, 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 if what we're gonna do is just uh, flip a coin some number of times, um, and what you're trying to infer is, is the probability of a head, um, um, here are some priors, and this doesn't look like the other priors I've been showing you, and that's because the optimal prior is typically discrete. Um, so this optimal prior is actually composed of a finite number of delta functions. So if I'm only going to flip one head, um, this prior puts half of its weight on a head and half of its weight on a tail. Um, so, so the prior is just two delta functions, one at 100% of the time heads, one at 100% of the time tails. Um, if you're gonna flip the coin many times, then it starts putting intermediate points, uh, putting weight on inter, ah, uh, sorry. Uh, then it starts putting weight on intermediate points. Um, and as I increase the number of repetitions, um, eventually um, the optimal prior approaches Jeffrey's prior. So in the limit of infinite data or infinite repetitions, um, uh, this optimal prior does reproduce Jeffrey's prior. Um, but only in the limit of infinite repetitions. Um, so you could ask why discreteness? Um, and uh, formally, when you uh, uh, look for a prior which maximizes the mutual information um, uh, subject to the constraint that, that the uh, 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 prior is normalized, um, what you get is that the KL divergence uh, between parameters and the data is a constant. Um, but subject to the inequality um, that, that the prior's weight at that point is greater than zero. Um, 
And, and so the solution is actually given by either the probability of, of, of having weight on a particular, or, or the weight on a particular theta in the prior should be zero, or the, the, the FKL, the KL divergence between um, this model and the total model should be a constant. And so just to give you a picture of what this looks like, um, here's the KL divergence, this FKL of theta. This is how much you expect to lose um, um, in this game should God choose that parameter value. Um, and what you can see is that it's a constant wherever my prior has weight, and it's always lower than that constant everywhere else. Okay, so that's why this is discrete. Um, and, uh, and now what I wanna show you is what this prior looks like for two exponentials. Um, and and uh, so as before, this prior is still discrete. Um, and at large noise, it actually only has weight on these two corners and at this single point in the middle. Um, which is geometrically the farthest from those. Um, as I decrease sigma, so as I make my error bar smaller and smaller, and my data gets better, I start to fill in this one-dimensional model here. Um, and remember, that's a simpler model, right? That's that's a single exponential. Um, and as my weight, as sorry, as my error bars get smaller and smaller, um, I start to put weight in the center, and I start to fill in this um, this full two-dimensional model. Um, so eventually the weight even is in the full dimensional model. Um, and I can look at one notion of, of the effective dimensionality of my model um, uh, by looking at the fraction of the weight that's on zero, one, and two dimensional models. Um, uh, so maybe this is getting at um, your question from earlier um, that, that indeed this is picking out mostly reduced models, um, but a combination of a few different reduced models. Okay, so um, uh, one thing I want to highlight is that this is adapting the dimensionality, not just in that sense of, of sitting on progressively higher dimensionality submodels, but also in terms of how it's spreading its weight out. So um, if I look at, at, at an intermediate value when I, uh, uh, when I haven't, you know, when, when the data is better, but still not great, I am filling in uh, models along this whole line, but I'm roughly evenly spaced, not in two dimensions, but in one dimension. Um, and then as I increase the, the quality of my data, um, I start to put more weight if I just look in one dimension in this center region, because there's a second dimension to explore there. So what I want you to note is that if I started with this prior over here, that would actually be very biasing along this one dimensional uh, model that I'm effectively exploring when I don't have a lot of data. Right, because this model is putting most of its weight in the center and very little out on the edges here. And if I can only infer one, one parameter anyway, um, that's very biasing um, along that single dimension. Um, so this is in a two dimensional model, um, but this is more extreme in a four dimensional model. Um, so now um, this is a four dimensional model and, and um, because of, of the limitations of the screen, um, you're just seeing it in two dimensions. Um, and and uh, the optimal prior starts out being pretty evenly distributed along one dimension. Um, eventually it becomes nicely distributed along two. Um, and now here you can start to see that it's getting some extra weight in the center here. And that's because in the two dimensions that you're not seeing, the manifold is getting thicker. And by the time you look at Jeffrey's prior, now this is just um, uh, uh, stochastically sampled, um, you can see that it's really avoiding um, these edges of the model manifold, um, even though there should be weight there. Okay, so how bad is Jeffrey's prior? Um, here in this dimension four that I was showing you, um, it's not actually so terrible. So this is a sum of the four exponentials sampled at five data points. Um, and what you can see is that Jeffrey's prior, Jeffrey's prior doesn't depend on the amount of data. Um, so it's the same for all of these, um, but it really avoids the edges of this model manifold. Um, uh, and, and, and that's true of the optimal prior, but only after it's been sampled uh, with very high, um, or sorry, only after um, the data quality is very good. Um, and if I quantify this by looking at the mutual information, um, what you can see is that when data is bad, there's actually a big gap between the amount of information that I get from the optimal prior and from Jeffrey's prior. Okay, so this is in dimension four. Uh, so a sum of four exponentials fit to five data points. 
Um, and now I want to show you what happens in, in much higher dimension. So um, Jeffrey's prior is very biasing in high dimension. Um, so um, to get you used to, to looking at this plot, um, now this data is being taken um, uh, in 26 dimensions. Um, but for now, this is still a three-dimensional model. And you can see a trace of that, that there's three peaks here. Um, this is at a sigma of 1 tenth. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is the optimal prior in blue. So it's still composed of a bunch of delta functions. Um, Jeffrey's prior in orange, and another prior which is commonly used, the log normal prior in pink. Um, and as before, sorry, I also need to tell you what you're seeing here. So this is um, the first two principal components of, of, of the Fisher information space, of the data space. Okay, and, 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 and what I want you to see here is that the optimal prior is very spread out along this. It looks evenly distributed along these two principal components. Um, and Jeffrey's prior is not, right? It's somewhat biased to the left-hand side here. Um, there's another way that I can display this prior, um, which is by plotting it um, versus time. Um, and you can see that the blue points are really spread out here. Um, and Jeffrey's prior and log normal are less spread out, right? So, so um, just qualitatively, um, Jeffrey's prior and the log normal prior are much less spread out in data space. Okay. Um, however, they're not so bad in the sense that if I then take some data over here, which is somewhat far from where Jeffrey's prior is located, all of these are able to do a reasonably good job of updating to make a posterior that, that looks like the data. Okay, but I can also look at this model in 26 dimensions. So, so now this is a sum of 26 exponentials. Um, and, and a few things to notice. Firstly, the optimal prior looks pretty similar, right? So it's, it's, it's now flat on the top here. Um, and that's because there's 26 different reduced models that you can choose that, that sort of smoothly interpolate here. Um, but it's still roughly covering this space. But Jeffrey's prior is now very different. So Jeffrey's prior is totally uh, confined to this very small region over here. Um, and that's because this region is, is much thicker in the 24 dimensions that you haven't seen. Um, and even though you can't see those other 24 dimensions, they're still much thinner than one, um, they're biasing Jeffrey's prior to sit over here. Um, I think this is more clear here. So, so the optimal prior looks pretty similar to the three-dimensional case, except maybe very far to the left over here. Um, but Jeffrey's prior is now very tightly constrained to this region in here. Um, so, and, and, um, and let me just say that, that now, um, the optimal prior still does a good job of updating um, after I see data, but Jeffrey's prior is very biased now. So Jeffrey's prior um, is sort of an interpolation between this point that for some reason Jeffrey's prior is very heavily weighted towards um, and where the actual data is. So Jeffrey's prior introduces a bias that really shifts um, the mean of the posterior over by many, many standard deviations. Okay. So the mutual information also declines precipitously for Jeffrey's prior. Um, so the optimal prior, um, if I plot its mutual information versus the number of parameters, um, I'm sorry, that, that should be D here, the number of parameters, um, what I see is that um, uh, as I increase the number of parameters initially, I do a better job. I, I have larger mutual information. Um, and then once I have enough parameters to fit the data pretty well, um, the mutual information saturates. On the other hand, um, for Jeffrey's prior, um, going from one to two parameters doesn't cause a problem. But as I go higher than this, um, uh, because of this issue that all of my weight gets centered at the very center of, of this 24 dimensional, 26 dimensional manifold, um, uh, the mutual information drops off precipitously. OK, so where did Jeffrey's prior go wrong here? Um, so the mutual information really measures the number of distinguishable states. Um, and, and it spreads out um, the mass of the prior um, to minimize the overlap. So it really tries to, to uh, maximize uh, the number of distinct models that you can count. Um, and on the other hand, the Fisher volume is really measuring the d-dimensional volume, regardless of the dimensionality of the actual data that I'm seeing. Um, and, and I think one way to quantify this is that the Fisher volume um, is really a product of, of the relative, the, the relevant volume um, and, and what I'd like to call an irrelevant co-volume. Um, and it's, 
variation in this irrelevant co-volume that really distorts the relevant space. Um, so um, just to, to give a schematic, maybe don't treat this as an actual equation, but a way of thinking about it. Um, Jeffrey's prior uh, is waiting by the proper volume element, but what we really want is, is the volume element just in the space of relevant parameters. So what we want is the volume element um, here in this two-dimensional space that I'm showing you. Um, but Jeffrey's prior is measuring um, the volume in the 26-dimensional space. Um, and you can think of that as the product of the local volume element, the one that we want, times the local cold volume. So how thick the space is in the other 24 dimensions. Um, and, uh, and what you can see from this is that those other 24 dimensions, for probably not very interesting reasons, are very thick right here. And they're very thin as I move away from this. Okay, so that, that's a qualitative picture. Um, to be a little bit more quantitative, um, maximizing the mutual information um, sets the distance to all of the models to be equal. So it sets FKL to be equal. And the mutual information is really the average of FKL. Um, so what I can define is a bias pressure, which measures um, how much the mutual information were to increase, were to I increase, were I to increase the weight on that particular parameter value. Um, and this bias is just FKL minus the mutual information. And uh, I claim that this roughly quantifies the minus log of the irrelevant co-volume. Okay, um, and, and just looking at that here, um, I haven't talked about the color scheme on this, um, but if you were to weight this particular model with Jeffrey's prior, um, what you would find is that there's a huge bias pressure at the corner here, um, because even though it's weighted by the proper volume, um, this is very far from, 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 from where there's a lot of weight. Um, and so I could increase the mutual information a lot by increasing the weight over here. Okay, so um, so so what went so wrong? Um, the essential problem is that Jeffrey's prior is not spread evenly along the relevant subspace. Instead, it's 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 being weighted um, by this irrelevant co-volume. Um, and just to quantify a little bit more um, why this causes problems, um, what you can see here is um, here here's the optimal prior in blue and Jeffrey's prior in red. Um, and what you can ask is, if I get a data point at one of these points marked with an X, um, and then I, I calculate my posterior and ask where its centroid is, so where its center of mass is, um, um, where the ends of these orange lines are is where Jeffrey's prior would put it, if that makes sense. So I gave one example of that before, model that was over here and had its centroid way over here. Um, and this is a more global picture of that. Um, and what you can see is that Jeffrey's prior often, well, it, it always wants to move whatever data it sees towards this point in the middle here, where for whatever reason, um, the model in the other 24 dimensions is thicker. Um, and, and this is really kind of an everyday picture of bias, right? The, that, that Jeffrey's prior will, will um, push um, the predictions of the model away from whatever data you've seen. Um, and there are similar lines for blue for the optimal prior. So it's not identically zero, but it's very small. Um, and what you're seeing um, in the lower plot is, is a plot of this posterior deviation. That's really the length of this line on the x-axis and this bias um, B of theta on the y-axis and just to show um, that, that these two measures sort of agree, right, that, that our quantification of bias, um, bias pressure is similar um, to this everyday usage of, of moves your model's predictions away from the data you've seen. Okay, um, uh, I just want to uh, talk uh, more broadly and philosophically for, for a moment. Um, this, this approach does pose a little bit of a problem for Bayesians. So Lindley is famous for saying that today's posterior is tomorrow's prior. Um, and the idea is that, um, that you can just keep iterating this. Um, so um, so I, I, I get some data, I update my prior and I get a posterior. And now if I get some new data, what I should do is just keep doing another Bayesian update. Um, um, and, 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 and what I wanna stress is that that's not actually true here. Um, 
So, um, so if I get new data um, in this framework, I also need to update my prior, right? Because the prior actually depends on what data I'm going to get. Um, so uh, we can talk after about how much this should bother you. Um, one thing I would point out is that this is also true of Jeffrey's prior, unless you carry out exactly the same experiment. So if I look at my data and I design a slightly different experiment, even in Jeffrey's prior, I need to update my prior. Um, but Jeffrey's prior does have the property that if you repeat the experiment, you never need to update it. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, what I've said is that the mutual information really quantifies learning from a prior. Um, then I introduced the idea of mutual information optimal priors. Um, they're discrete. They're, they're sort of interesting in this way that they um, select simple models in a way that I think is quite different from, from, um, from other, other reasons to prefer a simple model. Um, I've shown that they approach Jeffrey's prior, um, but only in the limit of infinite data. Um, and then the things that I really want to focus on here um, is that Jeffrey's prior is very biasing um, when there are many parameters, but not a ton of data. Um, and, and the reason for this is because it reweights by the irrelevant co-volume. Um, but uh, if instead you use a prior, which is optimal in the sense of maximizing the mutual information, um, you will not get any bias from this particular issue. Um, I want to uh, uh, thank my collaborators, in particular, Michael Abbott, who's really um, been, been leading this work um, and, and, uh, um, and really did all of the work on quantifying um, why Jeffrey's prior performed so badly. Um, uh, uh, in addition, this, this, a lot of this work was done with Henry Mattingly, um, who was also, uh -oh. um, Henry was also a major player in, in the work that I talked about last time. Um, uh, and this work grew out of um, a longstanding project of Jim Sethness to understand the structure of typical models um, uh, and, and sloppiness. And, and I talked about Mark's work um, in particular, thinking about the edges of model manifolds. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. Okay, thank you very much. So um, there were a bunch of questions um, during the talk. Um, uh, I know that I um, interrupted at several points. Do other people have other questions to add to the list? Michael, go ahead. Hey, um, I have to admit that I didn't understand anything, but I have I have a, one question is, I don't understand. So you said that with infinite data, you converge to Jeffrey's prior uh, with, I mean, infinite uh, future data. Uh, so can you explain, right? And you also explained to us how come Jeffrey's prior is so biased and bad. So how come Jeffrey's prior is so good with infinite data? So I think the way I would. Ben, you're silent. Nope, silent. Um, did you touch something or? Scott, can you hear? Can you help? No. Okay, there's Scott. But now, yeah, now I can hear it. Uh, do you know what I did? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have an answer. Uh, so, um, okay, so um, I think what's what's really important is that 
um, uh, the, the, the Fisher information space, which Jeffrey's prior takes its metric from, or its, its measure from, um, is not, to, it, 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 it is dimensionless. Um, so, so distances are measured in units of standard deviations. And this means there's an important distinction um, between widths that are smaller than one and widths that are larger than one. Um, and, and what you wanna do in the optimal prior um, is pay attention to the volume in widths that are um, uh, larger than one and ignore widths that are smaller than one, right? So, so I would say, uh, and this maps nicely onto the renormalization group meaning of irrelevant, that widths smaller than one are really irrelevant, right? They don't, um, if you move around in, in those parameter space directions, you move your parameters a lot, but you don't get different predictions. Um, and, and so when you have finite data, it's important that you don't wait by the volume in this irrelevant direction. But if you have infinite data, um, then all of the widths are much larger than one. All of the widths are infinite. And so this distinction between relevant and irrelevant um, becomes unimportant. Um, and, and Jeffrey's prior is the right thing to use because you really, in that limit, you really can infer even irrelevant parameters. And maybe a way to see this is, you know, if, if you have a tabletop uh, particle accelerator, you could measure the Higgs mass if you really have infinite data. Um, uh, so, you know, the, 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 the distinction between parameters that you can measure and parameters that you can't measure, um, you know, it, there's still a distinction of how well you can measure that survives to infinite data, but with truly infinite data, you could measure all of the parameters. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, a, a bit what you're saying is that Jeffrey's prior is correct when it doesn't matter. It, Jeffrey's prior is, I'm not gonna touch my keyboard, but can you say that again? <laughs> that Jeffrey's prior is correct when it doesn't matter. Uh, exactly. So priors are always derived in this limit of infinite data. And that's the limit where a prior doesn't matter at all. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's not just Jeffrey's. No prior matters in the infinite data limit. So long as the prior doesn't has full support, you're always going to get the right answer. That that's that is true. Yes. Yes. There's um, nothing specific to Jeffrey's at all. Yeah, and I think um, there's a sense in which um, so Jeffrey's prior is derived by considering this um, this asymptotic limit of, of of very large amounts of data, and there is a sense that that's pathological because that's you know, that's where it doesn't matter what prior you use. And you mean it considers that limit in the sense that it looks at the determinant of the, um, square, the square root of the determinant of the Fisher metric, and you're saying that the Fisher metric, it can be viewed as an infinite data limit, but you could also just use the Fisher metric as a saying expectation for a so, single, single data point. What, what I, yeah, so I, I don't, I mean, so you, you can derive Jeffrey's prior um, by considering a prior which maximizes the mutual information. And that requires the infinite data limit. You can argue for Jeffrey's prior in ways that don't require the infinite data limit. I agree. Okay. Um, yeah. Do we have other questions then? M maybe one last thing about the infinite data limit. I think many people would say, well, um, if you truly have infinite data, um, then the prior doesn't matter. But you know, the really relevant case is when you have um, a lot of data. Um, and in that case, the prior is close to Jeffrey's prior and, and that would justify it. And, and that seems sort of reasonable. And I think that's true if you have a small model um, or that can, can be true in a small model. But if you have a model with a lot of parameters, you're typically in the case that you are in the large data limit for some of the parameters and not for others. Um, and I guess that's the particular case that we think um, Jeffrey's prior is surprisingly distorting for. Okay. Do we have other questions there? Okay, well, um, virtual claps again. Where do we do this? Like, yeah, 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 clap, clap, clap. There we go. <laughs> so, um, you. Ben, this yeah. has really been um, very unfortunate the way everything has not come together as opposed to coming together. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, yeah, Between diseases COVID. and uh, snowstorms and... Oh, God. Um, but so I sent you an email. Um, um, I was wondering if you and 